Ladies and gentlemen, in this video, I'll be breaking down what you need to know about Chainlink. What problem does it solve? How does it work? How strong is their solution? And all that good stuff. Today's Chainlink deep dive is part of a series that I like to call Tech Talk Tuesday, where I break down cryptocurrency projects in an in-depth, but also easy to understand way. So make sure you're subscribed and you have notifications turned on down below so you don't miss any of these deep dive videos. Thanks in advance and without further ado, let's hash it out. So with Chainlink, what's the problem at hand here? Well, in the world of blockchain, one of the most touted inventions is the smart contract, which is quite literally a piece of software or written code that lives and executes on the blockchain in a decentralized manner. Smart contracts have the ability to revolutionize processes like escrows, asset transfers, and etc. because of the pure deterministic logical method by which they issue funds and perform actions. Determinism means that given a certain criteria or input, the result will be predictable and constant. Same input in, same output out. In the context of an escrow, for example, the smart contract will distribute the escrowed funds when and only when the conditions are met and will pay in full as the agreement states. No single party within the agreement facilitated by a smart contract can simply choose to break the terms. The code will govern what is allowed and what is not. However, there's a problem here because 99% of the time, not every piece of information needed for the contract to make these critical decisions or measure the criteria for certain actions is on chain and accessible at the time it needs it. For this, we need external data. For example, if you wanna set up an application that will deduct 5% penalties on a payout for produce shippers for every hour that the produce temperatures during transit rise above the target holding temperatures. You need to feed the temperature sensor data into the contract somehow for the contract to do its job. This external data feed to contracts is called an oracle. Now, a lot of hype is given to smart contracts, but the reality is, is that they aren't smart. They only do what the developer tells them to do, and the conditional logic can only execute with quality results when quality data is input through an oracle. In our example, it's not as simple as making the shipper submit the data because as a single data oracle, there's incentive for them as the shipper to fake the data to avoid the penalties. You then lose the core benefits of a smart contract, the decentralization and the disintermediation. By making the decisions and the criteria by which the data is processed, unilateral and centralized, the value is lost. This is where Chainlink is playing and this is where they're solving the problem. At its core, Chainlink is designed to provide a trusted, decentralized Oracle infrastructure and framework for smart contracts on multiple blockchains. The goal is to provide reliable, tamper-proof inputs and outputs on multiple blockchain networks that can be used to build complex and valuable smart contract ecosystems. Chainlink is led by CEO Sergey Nazarov, an experienced entrepreneur, and Steve Ellis, a software engineer who was formerly at Pivotal Labs. In my opinion, the team looks pretty darn solid and as someone who develops smart contracts for a living, I think the concept behind Chainlink has real value. And honestly, I would use it myself. I've actually started developing with it personally fairly recently. I will admit, I was a bit skeptical about Chainlink when it came into the scene because of the sheer volume of Oracle projects springing up. And quite frankly, there were a lot of bot comments on Instagram and on YouTube. But as I dug deeper during research for this video, my tune has really changed. I think there's something really powerful here and quite frankly, I haven't experienced this type of excitement about a project or product that's been delivered in quite a while. So that's really positive news. Of course, the idea is one thing, the use case is one thing, but the execution is the important part. So let's talk about Chainlink's execution and how this all works now that we know what it's all about. So how does Chainlink work? I would like to preface this by saying that Chainlink is currently live on the Ethereum mainnet and operating today, among other blockchains. So that's good news. There are, of course, more and more and more chains and integrations in the pipeline to support Chainlink as well. So this is not limited to Ethereum on its own. As I'm explaining this stuff, however, I'll likely keep it in the context of Ethereum. But that doesn't mean it's Ethereum exclusive. Chainlink is working to link up, pun intended, with other blockchains like Icon and Kava, the project on the Cosmos blockchain. With that said, let's break it down. To create an environment where data inputs to smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain can be facilitated in a decentralized manner, there's a need for both on-chain and off-chain components. 
A chain link network is really made up of several chain link nodes who can carry out data oriented jobs coordinated by the on chain Oracle contract or contracts plural. These Oracle contracts use link tokens as an incentive to chain link node operators to execute the specified jobs that smart contract developers contracts need to be done in terms of data feeds. These link tokens are also the financial deterrent for chain link node operators to falsify data, accept jobs they can't deliver, and so on and so forth. More on that later. Now, question of the day really quickly, do you hold link tokens? Let me know up in the poll above or down in the comments below. All right, let's unpack the on-chain components we just talked about first. The core functionality of the Chainlink ecosystem is encapsulated on-chain within the Oracle smart contract. This Chainlink Oracle contract serves as the core interface for DAP developers to interact with the off-chain Chainlink node operators. Think of the Oracle contract as the bridge that connects the on-chain contracts and components developed by DAP developers to the data providing Chainlink network nodes that reside off-chain. This brings me naturally to the second big on-chain component, which are the custom contracts created by DAP developers themselves that interact with the Chainlink oracles. I like to call these the consumer contracts because they consume Oracle data feeds from the Chainlink network. In essence, these consumer contracts are developed to integrate the core library of Chainlink functionality and communicate with an Oracle contract to send job requests to the off-chain Chainlink nodes. The data job requests sent by the consumer contracts are the means by which off-chain chain link nodes can pick up the data jobs. These requests in general usually contain the job ID, the link token payment amount, the data job execution parameters like what data they want, and the contract address or addresses plural that the data should be sent to upon job completion. The job ID identifies specifically the off-chain chain link node that needs to handle the request and subsequently defines the specifics of the data job that's being requested. Now, another thing to note here is that there can be more than one Oracle contract on the network. Quite frankly, there is. This allows both consumer contracts to choose which Oracle contract to send job requests to, and it also allows off-chain chain link nodes to register with one or many on-chain Oracle contracts to be able to decide where they're going to process and what jobs they're gonna pick. If this is confusing now, don't worry, it's gonna make more sense when we get to the off-chain components, but first, there's one final on-chain piece that needs to be mentioned here, the link token contract. The link token that I mentioned before is used in the network both to incentivize oracles to fulfill job requests with rewards, but also to deter oracles or these off-chain oracle nodes from performing poorly or acting maliciously in the network. So this link token contract minted 1 billion, that's billion with a B, link ERC20 tokens, which are also compatible with the ERC677 token standard, which is cleverly designed to allow transactions of tokens to also include a data payload that can be used to invoke smart contract functions, pass data, and all sorts of other cool stuff. This makes the ecosystem a lot more efficient and friendly because what used to take two transactions now can be done in one. This way, contracts implementing Chainlink functionality can transfer link tokens and perform an action without sending these two transactions. It can be done in one. I'm seeing more and more projects implementing this way and I'm really stoked about it. It's awesome. So to review the on-chain components, here's what you need to take away. The Oracle contracts are responsible for the following. Controlling which chain link nodes can fulfill data job requests, much like role management, a bridge communications between the on-chain consumer contracts and the off-chain chain link network nodes, and they communicate data job results from the Oracles back to the consumer contracts. They also control punitive link token lockups for poorly performing or malicious chain link network nodes that are off chain, among other things. Now, the key function of the Oracle contracts is to really transmit on chain job requests from the consumer contracts to the off chain chain link network nodes using Ethereum event calls. Now, the consumer contracts are simply custom contracts created by DAP developers that send Oracle data job requests to the off chain chain link nodes through the Oracle contract then they receive the requested data back for whatever use they need. The link token contract handles the core transaction functionality of the link tokens on chain that are used to pay for data jobs and deter malicious network activity. Boom, that is the on-chain stuff. We are making progress. So now let's talk about the off-chain part. Chainlink's off-chain network consists of several community-run oracles that sit outside the blockchain network, or networks plural, and these handle the data processing jobs and the submission of the requested data back to the consumer contracts on chain. 
At a high level, a Chainlink Oracle connects to the external data sources that might be, they process that data according to the job spec sent by a consumer contract, then they provide that data back to the requester on chain. There can be many, many Chainlink nodes that connect to the blockchain and each of them operate independently to process job requests. So when I say the off-chain network, I'm referring to the totality of these Chainlink nodes that are off-chain that are run by a variety of operators on a variety of different data sources. These Chainlink Oracle nodes are each composed of several distinct pieces that are necessary to do their job. That said, an operator of a Chainlink Oracle will have infrastructure that's generally as follows. Number one, a Chainlink node itself. This node software really handles the data requests from the consumer contracts on the blockchain, scheduling data jobs, executing each job's individual tasks, and then passing a signed blockchain transaction back to the requesting consumer contract with the results. Two, a blockchain node. This blockchain node is part of the Oracle's infrastructure that allows it to watch the blockchain for new requests from consumer contracts. These are watching events more so. And then to broadcast another signed transaction back to the blockchain to fulfill the data requests. And then three, external adapters. These are custom pieces of logic that perform certain operations on a data set. These adapters are extra tools that can be integrated into an Oracle to help massage and manipulate the data before it's returned to the requesting consumer contract. Adapters are a common architectural tool used in modern enterprise tech to manipulate data and translate it between multiple sources and stores. And then finally, data sources. These are the ever important data sources that the Oracle retrieves data from to provide to the requesting consumer contracts. These can be public APIs or a privately held data store. For example, the public IP API can provide geolocation data about IP addresses that can be used as an Oracle. To prevent the issue of centralized data feeds, however, many Oracles are built to aggregate data from multiple sources to get a more trustworthy data set. What you need to take away from this is that the off-chain Chainlink network is composed of the multitude of independently operated Chainlink Oracle nodes that can connect to the chain watch for their job IDs, handle requests for data, and earn link tokens for their work. Boom, well done. You now have a variety of Oracle options to choose from, and each of these Oracles can pull data from multiple aggregated sources to make sure the data is trustworthy. More on trustworthiness and decentralization of Oracles later on, so stay tuned. Now, to wrap this all up in one nice, cohesive package, let's walk through an example end to end. Let's say that I operate a Chainlink Oracle node to provide current weather data to consumer contracts. And I've deployed an Oracle contract to the blockchain that identifies different job IDs for requests or job specs my node will handle. Then let's say that you've created a consumer contract for your DAP from which you need to request weather data. Within your consumer contract, you will specify in the code which Oracle contract to consume data from. In this case, let's say it's mine. And then you'll also notify the address of the link token contract. This allows your contract to connect to the correct Oracle, in this case, mine. Then you would write functions that invoke each of the different data jobs by their job IDs and define the necessary handling functions or handler functions rather to process the return data. Now let's say you wanna request the current weather by zip code. You would initiate a transaction from your consumer contract to my Oracle contract containing the job request for the data identified by its job ID and containing any information or specifications needed for the data. Again, the critical component in that transaction that you send is the job ID, which tells the Oracle contract which particular data job you're requesting and then sets the job specifications accordingly. When the Oracle contract receives your transaction, it broadcasts an event to the blockchain that contains a job ID and parameters for your request. Of course, my node is watching for these events. So then this event is picked up by the blockchain node that resides in my Chainlink Oracle node setup, and that job is picked up for my node to handle in terms of the request. The job ID provided in the request pertains to a job specification that my Chainlink node will execute. And within this specification itself, it tells all the steps that need to be performed on the data by my Chainlink node. Each Chainlink node itself has a unique job ID for each job spec, which makes sure there is a clarity in which jobs are handled by which oracles. Next, my Chainlink node retrieves the requested weather data from the weather.com API, for example, performs any necessary operations on the data based on that job spec, and then returns the results via a signed transaction 
back to the Oracle contract on the blockchain. This matches up the requester ID for the job with the callback address or any other addresses added to the job request, which in this case would be your address because you're the one who's receiving the data back. Finally, your consumer contract will have a function that handles the return data as required, which will be triggered as a callback from the Oracle contract. This is a high level life cycle of a Chainlink Oracle request. So if you've made it this far, thank you very much. We've got a lot more awesome stuff in store about Chainlink, so stick with me. Now, I do wanna to touch on the Link token just a bit more. As we discussed, the tokens are used for two distinct purposes. One, to pay for data feeds from the Chainlink oracles and to establish deposits and penalties for bad actor oracles. The first purpose is self-explanatory. Consumer contracts that request data from oracles use Link to pay the off-chain oracles for data feeds. However, the other purpose for Link tokens that we have not yet addressed in detail is that consumer contracts can request deposits of Link to be made almost like a security deposit from a Chainlink Oracle as collateral until their job is fulfilled. This is to fight against potentially nefarious data feeds. The structural design is there to establish a disincentive for Chainlink Oracles off-chain to supply false or poorly managed data or to just not deliver at all because they can then lose the Link deposit that they must provide to fulfill a consumer contract's requests. This is clever. My only concern here is that when Chainlink is used on other chains, it will be reliant on the Ethereum network to manage issuance of Link tokens based on its current implementation. If I'm missing something here, I invite the community to correct me, but interoperability between chains can help solve this challenge, i.e. Cosmos, Polkadot, etc. Now, in this video so far, I've described what is very much so the current state of Chainlink that's live now, with a few caveats. However, there are some big features that are coming to bring things even closer to the vision outlined in the white paper that I want to address as well. Currently, we addressed already that consumer contracts must directly issue a transaction to an Oracle contract for each data request. This means that to aggregate data from multiple Oracles, it will require multiple transactions to multiple Oracle contracts with different job IDs. And then you must aggregate that data back when it comes in receipt. The biggest upgrade that's coming to Chainlink is the ability to coordinate requests for data using service level agreements. This will all happen within a coordinator contract of sorts. In essence, a service will be deployed to handle requests for data from consumer contracts and then route them to a variety of different Chainlink nodes that have signed up. These Chainlink nodes then be able to bid on these data jobs. This would make the ecosystem far less reliant on each Chainlink Oracle node deploying their own Oracle contract and shopping that and shipping that out to handle all of their own jobs. This results in better experience for consumer contract developers, allowing them to specify a job and then get matched with the best, best Oracle for the job without having to lock into a single Oracle contract up front. So generally the process for automated matching and service level agreements would be as follows. One, a consumer contract will draft an SLA defining what data is needed, how many Oracles must contribute and how that data will be aggregated. There'll even be a reputation measurement system built in to prioritize more trusted oracles for your data requests. Then from there, the coordinator service will broadcast that SLA to the event logs where Chainlink oracles can identify potential matches and bid for the right to fulfill that data request. Bidding Chainlink oracles are then matched to the request based on the parameters in the SLA, and their bids in link will be locked in as collateral for the request fulfillment. The selected Chainlink oracles fulfill the request for data according to the job spec, and the results are provided back to the aggregation contract specified in the SLA. This can be used to post-process data for whatever purpose the consumer contract requires. So think of it like that adapter yet again. So any oracle then providing false data or failing to deliver on the SLA will lose their bid and forfeit any rewards in Link that they would have received for successfully delivering on it. This will also be something that feeds into negative feedback for the reputation score as well as an Oracle. So the whole thing is set up as a truly decentralized processing mechanism for providing data on chain. This process is more efficient because it not only removes the need for self-managed and fragmented, to be quite honest, Oracle contracts for each chain link node, it also creates an effective micro economy for Oracle services with bidding on SLAs. This also solves the centralized Oracle problem in a way, because this system would further enable multi-Oracle requests where one job is processed by five, maybe even more Oracles, and then the results aggregated get passed back to the consumer contract. 
This doesn't mean that manual requests for oracles is no longer viable. Quite frankly, I feel that a manual selection of oracles will still be the predominant way that consumers get data, but having the option to do automated matching and fulfillment when manual selection is not feasible is a killer feature. Now, one minor concern or clarifying question that I have in this regard is, a proportion of Chainlink's functionality is native to the blockchain it resides on, and that's just natural, which in the current state is Ethereum, because the smart contracts are predominantly used on Ethereum. This is really good for performance. However, this also means that every blockchain Chainlink wants to integrate with, they need to adapt their core contract functionalities to that particular chain scripting language, like Zilliqa's Scylla language, for example. But that's not as complete or powerful as Solidity is, despite the flaws. Maintaining a code base for one on-chain and off-chain tool is plenty, but then adding multiple chains and multiple languages and multiple scripting languages and multiple virtual machines, you get the idea, gets really arduous. The good news and sort of a semi-answer to my question, at least what I think is happening, is that Chainlink is targeting interoperability chains like Icon, like Cosmos, to solve this problem. Using ICON's cross-blockchain communications protocol, for example, Chainlink oracles could serve data to a variety of blockchain networks without having to custom develop for each one. This could put oracles in more hands, on more chains, with a relatively low level of effort opposed to custom builds for each chain. Great move. If this is the idea, then please let me know. All in all, I'm really excited about what Chainlink is building, and some of the notable partnerships and development teaming they've done are going to be paramount to their success. I'm not gonna go through every single partnership because the list is way too long, but there are significant, significant names on that list. And I'm sure in the comments down below, people will be commenting their favorite Chainlink connections, their favorite Chainlink partnerships, and hopefully you guys can read that list down below. So I'm a huge fan of Chainlink and their work, and I have high hopes for the future development of their decentralization features. And as always, folks, I hope you can stick around to check out one of these other videos here. I have awesome Tech Talk Tuesday videos for you to check out other protocols. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, cheers.